Welcome, everybody. Today, we are taking a deep dive into pain science, injury identity, and how this relates to a slap tear diagnosis. I've got my good friend, Phil White, expert physical therapist, physiotherapist for the rest of the world, joining me again. And yeah, this is a concept a that, that has been quite profound for me personally, and it's something that I think you're going to really enjoy learning about. Welcome to the Unity Gym Podcast, brought to you by VPA Australia, our trusted supplement source since day one. As VPA-sponsored athletes, we're excited to offer you a special 10% discount on their premium supplements available worldwide. Just use our discount code listed in the episode description. Today's episode is also sponsored by the Slap Tear Rehab Blueprint. If you're overwhelmed by rehab tips on social media, our blueprint provides clear results-based methods to help you return to your favorite activities faster and stronger than surgery can get you there. Best of all, it's free. Grab it through the link in our description. If you'd like a personalized slap tear rehab program tailored to your needs and goals and support every step of the way via online one-on-one -on -one coaching, check out my slap tear rehab program. To get started, click the link in the description, create an account, complete a short pre-exercise questionnaire, and I'll welcome you on the inside. And remember, as Amazon affiliates, you can get all the equipment used in our videos and podcasts at competitive prices through our affiliate links in the description. Now let's dive into today's episode. Welcome, Phil. Thank you for joining us for this really important discussion. I know we this finally is made it. It's yeah, the stuff that I just always want to talk about and every episode ends up mentioning it, but <laughs> yeah, anyway. And I've, I've been steering always... you away for the last couple going, no, no, no because I want to Jumping at the bit, just hold me back, Yanni. Don't yeah, make me go through right. pain science again. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And there's kind of, there's a few elements here that we're going to sort of take a deep dive into pain science and, 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 and what that is exactly, the nocebo effect and how that relates to injury rehabilitation and injury diagnosis and mindset just in general, you know, and then how to overcome an injury identity if it, and what an injury identity is. This is a big one too. And then really we're, how to move forward from there, you know, and how it applies to exercise and what you should be sort of focusing on instead. And, uh, you know, the first time that you introduced this topic to me was many years ago when we were still in Unity Gym in North Sydney and we had the podcast studio. And, you know, it was it was really quite profound for me. I actually started to really d dive deep into it and, and apply it to the very baseline concept of you know pain being a symptom of the brain based on perceived threat and then if i hurt myself like you know i've i've shared this story before like i burnt myself once in the kitchen cooking dinner and i sat there and really focused deeply on the sensation that i was experiencing and then started to just reaffirm to myself that there was no danger there was no further danger there i wasn't still burning myself that that the the incident had come and gone and it was quite surprising to my surprise it it had an effect positively on the experience of pain itself in that moment now i know that that sounds a little bit like you know yeah. out there but i'm telling you right now that the pain dial which i'm sure you're going to talk about in in a moment was turned down you know and yeah and it's something that i really want to like jump on this quickly because i think like that's super cool and i'm really glad that you had that experience but like the thing that a lot of people, as soon as they hear about pain science, they start to, and like, there's like, you know, some people push back against it saying like, oh, you know, you're just telling me it's all my head and like to think my way out of it. And that's definitely not the case. Like, it's not something you're just like, as soon as you know, you can just think about it differently and have a completely different response, like, or result. But it is something that like, it should provide context around whenever you're experiencing pain to understand like what purpose that pain is serving and like to you and as a human <laughs> with a body but also like what are the actionable things that you can do about it so like that definitely is cool that you had that like in the moment being able to think about it differently to experience it differently but I, I think it's like I just don't want to set the expectation that as soon as you learn this you just like become some zen like monk figure that can just um you know just <laughs> superhero who can, uh, but it is really it relevant like I remember having the most like one of the most intensely painful things I did was working with Rad back in the day when we were in the gym. And I wanted to, like, I was doing, you know, treatments for you guys. And it was kind of nice to, like, I guess, get something out of it for myself where we'd, like, I always love the barter economy where you trade things for things instead of paying money. So I was, like, uh, for a while there getting my parents to come in and train the gym and doing treatments for you. But then with Rad, it was like, okay, what's, like, something that I can get from you where I can do a treatment and get something in result, like, in response? And he, offered to tra uh, train me in a bit of Kung Fu, which is something that I've never done any martial arts. I've never done anything like it. And I was like, 
it was not appealing, but I always loved just different, like learning new skills, different physical experiences. So I was like, great, that'd be really cool to do some sweet moves and, you know, flip around and jump around and stuff. And then like in true Red style, because he's a, I don't know, he's a funny character, but he like, you know, he's very, he gets super serious. Like Kung Fu is like, with such a big passion for him. And he's like, all right. So like, it was like 45 minutes of just like a bit of mobility. And then it was we're not going to move on until you can do a 10 minute horse stance. And if people don't know what a horse stance is, it's like kind of like a wall sit, except you have to be very specific about where your feet are, where your knees are and how you're back sitting. And basically it's a, a, a yeah, basically like effectively a, a wall sit. And I just remember going into this place during that, like first time I tried it where I just like could not think because the pain was just like screaming through my brain in such an intense sort of way. But he said like practice every day. And then next week we'll see how you go. And it, like, until we get to 10 minutes, like we're not going to move on from this. And so, like the whole week I, I was practicing it, going through it, it sucked, it hurt. And then like, I remember that next time, that next week I came in and did it, I sort of got into a state where it was like, the pain was still screaming, but I was able to like position myself outside of it <laughs> and able to sort of view it objectively. And then it became like something that wasn't, yeah, I guess it was no longer threatening. It was just like an experience and I was able to be outside of that. And I've tried meditation so many bloody times and I've never had like that same level of, I guess that like disconnection and like viewing of yourself in like a, a slightly different way than, than I did there. And I think it just the experience, like I ended up going for like 12 and a half minutes and he's like, sweet, we can move on and <laughs> went cracking on from there. But it was just like such a cool thing to, I guess, like, yeah, experience it and see it objectively. And I think that like, it sort of frames the way that I'm going to talk about this because like with basically like all people I work with, whether they're injured or not, like I like to kind of talk about pain first because obviously when people get like started in exercise, they sort of think, oh, it's going to be painful. It's going to be hard. It's going to be horrible. And then like not knowing what pain means and not being able to like put pain in a place makes it all sort of seem equal and all bad. But I like to think about it now and this isn't, I don't think it's like a thing. This is just something that I've come up with to help explain it. But I like to think of like discomfort as being like an expected pain experience from an exercise you're doing. So if you're sprinting up hills or you're lifting heavy weights, you're getting that burn from, you know, doing some like high repetition bodybuilding style workouts. Then I like to kind of think about that as discomfort. Pain is like the objective thing. Like that is just the pain experience, but it's discomfort if it's sort of expected and understand it. But then you can have like an injury that causes pain where it's obviously like unpleasant, but then I'd like to think about it as like suffering is pain when that has a negative impact on like what you're doing in the rest of your life and how you're thinking and, you know, psychologically, psychologically identity wise. So having those kind of three different ways of like viewing the same experience, I think just helps knowing like, okay, like, is this like, if it's just the objective pain thing that I can then take that information and, and help me understand what to do about it. But like, if I'm feeling a pain that isn't changing my life and it's not changing what I'm doing, like you can sort of again, step back from it, experience it somewhat more objectively. And then as we'll talk about in the, like what impact the way you think about it has on pain, uh, you can make some moves forward. So like, I don't know if that's overly helpful at, at this stage, but I think just like there's, yeah, it's important that there's like different ways you can view pain. Well, it's what you're talking about there is cognitive e effusion, you know, where, where you're disassociating from something a, a feeling a sensation an urge and it's it's actually interesting because that's that's a topic that i've gone really deep on because of my endeavors to sort of figure out depression and anxiety and things that i've dealt with all my life and there are some really really good resources to learn about this but it, i guess it can be applied to this topic as well which is you know you we 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 tend to fuse to our cognitive behaviors thoughts feelings emotions sensations urges and make them us we 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 think that they are our identity you know and we can't escape them but you you certainly can and how it's applied to to pain and discomfort you know the the, the example that comes to mind always is the 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 book from Norman Doidge, The Brain's Way of Healing. I don't know if you've read it. It's a brilliant book, very good. And he, most of the research that he's using throughout that book is based on a clinic in the United States where they're working with amputees and the majority of war vets, veterans who have had a leg blown off or an arm blown off or something like that. And they experience this concept of phantom pain, which is pain in the limb that no longer exists, you know, and how do you treat pain in a foot that's no longer there or pain in a leg that's no longer there, you know? And what they found is that no amount of opioids or drugs or anything solves that problem. You, you have to learn to disassociate from that sensation, you know, and, and rewire the brain effectively, you know? And, and so I guess 
having read that book really helped me after, you know, and I read that book after you introduced this concept to me, you know, because I wanted yeah. to go down the path. And I, of course, next thing I did was get online and say, who, you know, who's leading this sort of research? What are the best books? Da, 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 and I went down and, yeah. and, and read three of Norman Deutsch's books, two of them, and then a study that he'd done published. And, uh, you know, I found that that was really, really useful stuff. And and like you say, in everything, you can apply this to exercise. For me, one of the most uncomfortable things that I do is run. I, I don't like running, but I really like how it makes me feel afterwards. And there's there's a reason for that. You know, I've had these two lower limb injuries that generally play up when I run. There's some sort of discomfort or pain that I feel. And you experienced this once when when we went for a run together with with Link, our good friend Link, mutual friend Link. Uh, I think we ran, it was about 10 to 13 kilometers. It's not, not a huge run for a runner, you know, but after about eight or nine kilometers, my knee was playing up, my ankle was playing up and eventually I had to stop and, uh, and, and we walked back together, you know, because I just could, couldn't keep running. But I apply this often when I'm running, both for that sensation of, you know, really burning lungs when your cardiovascular is being pushed or when I'm when I'm running, because the moment I set foot outside and start to jog, I start to experience a level of discomfort in one or more of the injuries that I've had in my body, you know, and I have to figure out whether that's something serious that I should pay attention to, or whether it's something that I just need to sort of disengage from, disassociate from, that's going to restrict my ability to get better at running or, or what I'm doing, you know. So yeah, it definitely can be applied to lots of different things yeah yeah and i guess to, to get into the like science of it and how this works is like i think it's important to actually before we do i just want to talk about like that that idea of suffering if we link it to the injury identity i think that's where like that becomes really applicable is about like when you ha you're experiencing pain and then that flavors everything you do and I, I as i talk about it with my patients is like it's like you're wearing a set of glasses that you know it, it's has like a <laughs> something that you're always looking at your pain like it just colors everything you do um it's, so it's everything the pain, is like it's the pain glasses yeah you exactly know. like everything you see is like it starts like flashing red if it looks like you know physical or <laughs> or challenging you just start thinking like oh i can't do that because i might get injured and you know i don't want to go on that trip or i don't want to go on that like on that run or i don't want to go on that holiday because it's like you're constantly worried about it. it frames everything you do and the way you see yourself so that's where like I'll, the injury identity just, just getting my pain glasses hey, there my, your pain glasses. my injury nice. glasses so can, i'm <laughs> kidding so, yeah. swanswick would be very upset with me if i said that yeah. these were injury glasses no. but you know what you, you know what i mean metaphorically when you've hurt yourself yeah. and you 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 just, i guess cultivate an injury identity everything you do is like looking through these tinged yeah. glasses you know and this you, was me for so many years where it was just like i can't you know i can't do that i'm just gonna hurt myself i can't like do that tournament i can't like you know go on that trip or whatever just because I, I thought i was gonna hurt myself and that just can really become just such a like detrimental and downward spiral in, in terms of how you're feeling about yourself but also then the effect that has on your pain because getting into exactly what pain is it's your body's expression of perceived threat and more specifically your brain's expression of perceived threat and so your brain's you know the supercomputer in your head that's like constantly trying to assess the world and give you the best chance of survival and the best chance of then you know, get to a stage where you can procreate. So that's like what we're wired to do is <laughs> just like survive and like keep the species going. So it's not a like not a brain that's like designed for optimal living in the 21st century. Like it, it's, it's those two things. So your brain is really wired to like assess threat and then give you information to like deal with that threat. So the key thing to understand there is like you don't have pain nerves. You don't have nerves that are like, if you stimulate that nerve, you'll have X experience of pain in a linear way. You have information nerves that send information about your environment and so there's like uh, mechanoreceptors semi-receptors chemical receptors uh, a whole bunch of different types of receptors that give you information about you know if they're like if there is damage to the area so notice i say damage here but not necessarily pain there's you know high heat cold like, like fast contractions like rough surfaces all of these things we have nerves that give that information and so and again, sorry for those who've listened to this plenty of times before, but th those nerves, so for example, if you had a paper cut, like you'll have those nerves sending signal up through your arm along your nerve pathways to the spinal cord level. And then that dial you mentioned before, so at that stage, we can dial up the, like your, your body will dial up the, that signal or turn it down. And that's gonna come through the 
kind of metabolic state that you're in. So if you're in a high adrenaline state where you're running away, like running for your life, you're probably not going to experience like your body's like, baby cut, don't care, turn it down. <laughs> so it's like not important to your survival. So your body's like turning that down with that high adrenaline state. Whereas if you're in a, like a chronic inflammation state, you're in a like really, you know, like in a, in a, a, a unhealthy state, you're probably going to be turning up that those signals. So then those signals then go up through your spinal cord and out to your brain. And then they're processed there and modulated again. So changed in a way where your thoughts, moods, belief, and context then informs how you then experience the pain. So pain is an experience. It's not like a thing in and of itself. It's like, it's, a, it's an experience. So that's why when you have surgery and you're no longer conscious, like it's just basically putting you to sleep, but you can't feel anything. So you can't experience pain. So the thoughts, moods, belief, and context, that's like all of, you know, that's your, your brain's constantly collecting information about the world to give you the best chance of survival and procreation. So it's giving you, you know, it, your past experiences when you've say like, you know, if you touch a, <laughs> touch a hot stove and you, you burn yourself, you know, in the future, not to do that again, or like, and you start to get this ability to see patterns and recognize situations. And that will have that effect on both like the conscious and the subconscious mind. So there's certain people who just, you know, they just get freaked out about, you know, being, near the water because they've had like a bad experience with you know nearly drowning in the past something like you don't like it's this like combination of subconscious and and be you know causing you to have that like heightened state of like stress and anxiety and threat which then can really turn up the volume on on the situation so the and the important like thing to if we talk about like that paper cut for example if you're a concert pianist and you have a con like a concert that night your pain glasses, like <laughs> you're going to be looking at that finger. You're going to be there with a magnifying glass, like brain wise being like, oh my God, this is going to be like detrimental to my livelihood, my life. Like if I can't, you know, like make it through this concert, then like I'm going to get bad reviews. I'm going to get <laughs> like boot off the stage. All of these things are just like a real heightened threat to your sense of self, your survival. So that paper card is going to be absolutely devastating and you're your your brain's going to be just like honed in on that and you're going to be experiencing it so much more whereas you know for someone like a runner for example who's you know running like the race of life or they're you know person playing football or rugby whatever like that paper card is going to be so insignificant compared to <laughs> um you know getting tackled on on field and all of the other things that go in their body so your 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 brain's going to be like okay i'm hearing you information from my finger that there's like you know there's something going on there but the more important thing is the fact that I just got headbutted by a dude uh, coming at me at like, you know, 20 kilometers an hour and I've got some serious like bruising or something going on over here. So your brain's able to basically, yeah, turn the dials on this different information to then give your, you know, give your, like to give you the information of like, what's the most threatening situation here and how do we deal with that? So that's like a big overview of like, I guess the pathway of like stimulus through to experience. Um, and hopefully that just like the thing that I want people to take away from there is like, remember it's like you can have, like you don't have pain nerves. So like more pain doesn't necessarily like result from <laughs> more damage. You have like all this information and that's modulated in those two areas. So that like, and damage does not necessarily equal a pain experience or a you know, dysfunction. Yeah, look, and I've I've experienced this myself personally, and I've watched friends of mine as a competing as a boxer myself since I was a, a young teenager, right through to I was thirty years old. You know, I sustained a broken rib that was actually dislocated, like the the cartilage was broken and the rib protruded forwards during a, a sparring session, and I continued. You know, I I didn't stop because I was more fixated on what I wanted to achieve and the outcome of that of that session. And I was more focused on the risk of getting punched in the face, even worse than what that pain was there, you know, and, 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 and I'm sure there are people that will, will, will be able to relate to that and how this I've noticed it, this affects people who are diagnosed with a slap tear is when they first come to us, they're terrified of certain movements that have caused them problems in the past before, you know, like a, a bench press or a, a, a bent row or a, a vertical press is often one that they're really terrified of or anything with the hands above the head, overhead, working in that plane of movement. And what we try to say is, look, the, the role of a good coach is to manage load, find what you're capable of, try to explore and expand the 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 body's capabilities using progressive overload and we can, there's so many different tools that we can use at our disposal to, to to manipulate loading variables to make sure that you're getting sufficient stimulus 
to progress you forward, to start building strength in the area, regaining that stability in the shoulder. And an example of that is a very obvious example is just the range of movement that you work in. You know, you don't have to work in a full range of movement in these planes. You can work in a limited range of movement or you can change the apparatus that you're using. It may be not okay using a barbell and we may use something else. So we may just use bands. We may just use cables. Yeah. We may find that a barbell is actually better because yeah. it creates so more I think stability. All those know? things are like excellent for managing the pain experience and modulating things to like physical things to, I guess, change, um, you know, what aggravating factors you might have. But like thinking back even kind of before then about why people are so terrified about like doing these exercises and when they've experienced pain in the past is because people have this think like they have this understanding that if it is painful, therefore I'm doing more damage. And that's the thing that like really puts the brakes on people is like, I don't want to do anything that hurts because I'm making it worse. And the problem with that is, as I said before, like just because you've got like, th th there's not a linear link there. Like you don't have, you know, X amount of damage equals X amount of pain and more pain equals more damage. So the there's not that like linear link. So there's so many other factors. So like, it's important to realize that, you know, there are so many things where, you know, it like, like for example, like a tendinopathy, like you need to train to a level where you are causing enough pain, <laughs> like you are causing a like sufficient load, which is going to cause a certain amount of pain to then like help remodel the tissue and make it better long term. So like that's not damaging it; it's stimulating it in a way that it needs to. And the thing that like specific to the slap tear in the shoulder and a lot of areas in, in chronic like with pain is there's a level of what's called sensitization that plays such a big role in pain where basically like part of it is that like mental magnifying glass that we can have on areas that become like mean the whole area gets sensitized but also when you've got an injury and you get like an inflammatory process and you keep doing aggravating things that keep that area in that inflammatory process you've got like a double whammy of your brain magnifying glass and you've got like a metabolic state around the area that's not ideal so it's like this this area becomes like the all the dials are turned up on this so both your brain dial and your like spinal cord level metabolic dial are turned up so basically like any amount of stimulus then becomes like an intense pain experience so so much of what we need to do initially is just like help people like like desensitize the area so if they're in acute phase then that does mean like really reducing what's going on there and helping them like find you know movement strategies to avoid that uh you know it might be like some short-term like pain modulation things like you know heat pack or ice just to like change that experience and then part of it then you want to be like gradually exposing your that that area to movement again because again when you're sensitized like this is a real issue with amputees again like going back to like we had phantom pain before but then for example like people who've had amputations often get like hypersensitive or, or burns victims have this like where you get such sensitive scar sites that they just like can't handle any amount of stimulation and the like the treatment for that like sticking your hand in a bowl of like first they start off like something soft and then they build up to like putting your hand in like a bowl of rice and like like really trying to rough up your hands and like <laughs> like doing all these things like hitting tapping like scar massage all of these things to basically like desensitize the area because again like the magnifying glass the mental magnifying glass and the like local environment is just like so geared towards like listening to every single bit of signal but just like in the way that if we bump our elbows or you know if your kid hurts themselves like you'll give it a rub it's because you're like desensitizing the area by giving it other signals that sort of, and that's how a TENS machine works as well as like overloads that area with like different signals. So you then don't have that pain experience so, so intensely. And so where this again becomes practical about training is that by like, if you're in the acute phase, we want to like desensitize the area and then build you back up gradually. But a large part of it is knowing like, what are you most sensitive to? How do we like bring down that one particular factor? And then how do we gradually expose you to that? Because like once, you know, you've seen if you've been assessed, you've been diagnosed, you know what's going on. Like we want to make sure that we can like build you up to your best possible level. But what people do is just go too much too soon or they make the mistake of thinking like, you know, for example, that all mobility and stretching is inherently therapeutic. Whereas that, as you said, range of motion might be the most aggravating factor. So like how do we gradually expose you to those things in a way that's controlled, the way that like, is progressive and that helps not only physically to get the adaptations we want, but also mentally to prove to yourself that you're capable and confident. Because again, with perceived threat, it's very hard to feel under threat if you're making progress and you're seeing yeah. like results. But if you're so scared about doing anything, you're so worried about doing anything, 
that you won't push any weight and you feel like you need to like change how you do every single exercise and movement and like carrying the groceries and putting your shirt on like then because you're not like making progress you're not feeling any like better then you're going to feel under threat so the key thing is like we've got to figure out a way of desensitizing the error by gradual exposure but also like mentally helping you yeah like feel like remove that injury identity by making good progress and feeling confident and, and I it's think not a, is... yeah you can't just like think your way out of it you've got to prove it to yourself with experience and that's where having the confidence of someone helping you with it can help you get past those like oh, what does this mean what does that mean because like and just quickly like I, we've sort of talked about pain really generally but like different symptoms do, do give you different information and that's why being able to talk to a you know a physio a physical therapist whatever being able to say like okay i'm experiencing this like you know whether it's burning a dull ache a sharp ache a clicking or whatever and then knowing what that means so yeah just in, like, I think it's such it's such an important concept to get your head, to wrap your head around because one, like the most obvious example of this is when you go under the knife and you go and have an operation and within you know a day or two after they're going to get you up and moving because it's so important that we start to stimulate the muscle tissue that's been you know affect, affected by the by the surgery and I found this the most difficult after my knee reconstruction you know I felt totally incapable of moving of standing up the day after my surgery but they said the physio said you've got to get out of bed we've got to get you up you know and and it was so uncomfortable and it was so painful but we had to get moving and every during that first sort of four to six weeks of of of, of rehab of of physio Every time I went to the physio, we were doing things that didn't feel good, that didn't feel comfortable, you know, and it was all about reassuring and making sure that I was, you know, really understood that there was no threat here. There was no, it, it, the threat was that I didn't do the physio, that I didn't move, you know, that I didn't get the muscles working again. And anyone who's been under the knife or had surgery or ha had a really traumatic injury that has to go through rehab will be able to relate to that initial feeling of this doesn't feel right it's so painful it's so uncomfortable I sh you know surely I'm doing damage or surely I'm making the injury worse you know and the reality is is that you have to learn that yeah there is there is and that's where good pain yeah, that's why it's so important to work is... with a professional who can help you like understand that because going on your own saying like oh they've said pain's fine like it's just a brain thing it's all right doesn't mean anything like that's not the takeaway we want you to have <laughs> yeah that's um, what i was yeah. about to say is there are good yeah. pain signals that are really useful and and you need to listen to them and then there are pain signals that aren't serving you really that well and you need to learn how to navigate those as well and 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 push through them and 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 come out the other side stronger you know and so yeah it's a it's a good topic it's and again that's where it comes down like from when i originally started this like kind of knowing that it's like that expectation around again that discomfort of like okay this is exercise related <laughs> pain this is like the objective experience of pain or this is suffering and, and again i would just see so often particularly people with like slap tears because so often it is like active they're really like you know they love a sport they want to do a thing and they're so desperate to get back to it and this is getting the way of it like they just get like so again that that mental magnifying glass on <laughs> on the issue that that just like really does lead to that injury identity which is just that that, su that the effect of the the suffering which is that pain leading to a change of behavior the change in what you see yourself and change in what you can do so yeah what we're talking about here is like getting clarity and understanding so you can like go forward with confidence and if you do like experience pain that sucks and it's like important to have someone who can help you decipher what that means but then like once you've got that confidence and knowing like okay some things will just hurt but i can like sit outside of it knowing like objectively view it like i did with my um uh that horrible horse dance that rad made me do you can sort of sit outside of it and and experience it without it leading to anything like yeah yeah, yeah. well look i mean i i went on four years for four years after my initial slap tear competitively boxing at a very high level and then have but have done weights have done crossfit have done all sorts of stuff now if i go back and get an mri right now my shoulder still looks pretty much the same as it did back then. The anterior portion of the labrum, everything there is still detached. It hasn't healed itself miraculously, you know. And if I fixated on that morphology and scan and what the body looks like there, then I probably never would have done what I was doing. And this is an example of, you know, the, the, I, I don't experience pain. Every once in a while, I get a little bit of aggravation there, but I just move beyond it. I, I know that what I'm capable of and I know what I should be focusing on. And, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's a very, very important thing to, to, to sort of wrap your head around, you know. So, yeah, I guess the actionable, actionable takeaways is obviously like number one is like getting clarity and confidence, working with someone who can guide you through those experiences and help you understand like if this pain you really need to 
listen to and avoid at all costs or if it's something that you know and and how do you again desensitize the area and then and then like build up your like your abilities through there but then also the other big thing is that like the, the biggest way to combat that injury identity is seeing every injury as an opportunity to work on something else because if you can see every injury as an opportunity to shift your focus focus on something different so if you have a, sh a slap tear like your lower body strength improve your squat work on the splits like start running something where you can just get that tangible progress and really feel like you're you know you're more than just your shoulder injury like that is just the the key thing to do there because again if you're like used to doing heavy weights athletic stuff calisthenics whatever in your upper body and then you're told to like take it really easy and do some well not like you know back off a lot be really controlled in what you're doing and you know you're not hitting pbs anymore it can really you can lose that positive momentum so the way you keep that momentum up is like shifting your focus like putting that focus into it like a new opportunity of learning a new skill making progress thinking like geez i have done you know so much strength and mobility for a while but my cardiovascular system is really you know not as good as it used to be and i know that vo2 max is important for my longevity and health so maybe this is a chance for me to like get in and get stuck into some like hardcore you know cycling repeats on a bike where you're pushing yourself to the limits and like something like that where or, or you know pushing to get the splits or like lower body strength something like that where it's like okay you're getting such tangible progress you're feeling like you're a strong capable person and, and you've really made the most of that time because so many people like mourn the time lost to injury as like you know life they'll never get back it's like you know you spent time with an ex and you know you just delete those three years from your life like it was just a total waste of time but there's always positives you can take from that experience and you don't want to like you know see it all as this like negative waiting for life to happen like you need to really embrace life now and make it those shitty times where you've got an injury like turn into some, some really and so many of like the best things in my life has been like due to that after nailing my ankle in a uh, mountain biking injury i decided like i hate swimming but my mom's gonna do it of course i'm gonna join her because like i can't <laughs> do the things that i want to do because my ankle's like in a really bad way and you know starting ocean swimming just unlocked my current life and my met my partner and have a baby like there's all these things that, that really came from that very intentional like okay my old me would have moped <laughs> and just been depressed that I wasn't able to do, you know, play the sport that I wanted or was doing at the time. But now like it's, it's so that shift in focus that then just has such a profound effect on like your mental state. And that does have a really positive impact in your pain experience because of the fact that like, it's hard to feel like perceived threat when you're so happy and feeling like you're really kicking goals. So. Yeah, absolutely. And and the, the fi my th final thought is that it comes from a comment of a professional rugby league player that we had in Unity Gym for a while, a guy called Craig Wing. And he once said to me, you know, the only game you ever play in, in professional sport uninjured is your first game. And from that point on, you're managing something that's wrong, you know, that's injured. And if those guys can get out there and do what they do on the telly every week and perform at such a high level, constantly compromised, then I'm pretty sure we can all get over our slap tear and just be fine, you know? And, and it's, it really mindset does play a big role in that. Yes. But also like, I don't want the message takeaway to be push through pain. Like that is definitely, yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely yeah. not the takeaway because again, like pain is your brain's like perception of perceived threat. And often it's right. Like often it is right. Like your brain's got the right idea that like, <laughs> don't do that thing. It hurts. And that's really important. But the thing you need is someone who can help you navigate that and if you're in a state of chronic pain where you've had an acute injury or you've had a digit like a thing that's come on over time but then it's lingering far past it's you know when it should have been there like you know it, it's, it's lingering and lingering and lingering that's when you really need to have that guidance to know when to push through pain when to like what variables to change and like when to not listen to it so yeah don't and don't take away our, yeah that goes back <laughs> yeah. to our previous conversation of getting building the right network of experts around you you know and that's been a, a an overarching theme for this whole series on slap tears you know the network the experts that you employ or you liaise with or you communicate with or you befriend you know are going to be are going to make or break your recovery you know get people in your corner who are positive who are lifting you up who are encouraging you and for god's sake who understand you your sport and your injury <laughs> don't don't just go with the local person who because it's convenient you know this is something if you're dealing with a slap tear uh, this is something that you need to sort of possibly go a little bit further than the con than the convenient physio down the road you know, or the convenient doctor that your parents yeah. know or something like that, you know? Remember yeah. The, and reach out to us. You, you've got the internet, yeah. you know, you can do it through YouTube. You can do it through, you know, we are a channel who will 
comment and, and, and respond to every single comment. And so, you know, yeah. And if we need to take it further, we can, we can do that. We can, we can liaise via email. We can, you know, we can connect properly. Uh, and, and yeah, that's, that's, uh, yeah. remember that's the three cool. rules of finding the right person. If they've had the same thing as you, if they've like, they do the similar activities that you want to do. And if they have worked with a lot of people who have the same thing. So, I mean, I do believe that we, tick that box pretty well because you know we've all had slap tears we work with a lot of people who have slap tears and we're all doing some pretty fun training despite the fact that we've had slap tears in the past but certainly like if you're wanting to work with someone in person then just like ring around it's worth doing a bit of like research to find the right person and those three things are going to be your best bet at finding the right person for you absolutely it's either going to make or break your recovery that's all we got time for guys i want to quickly give you a little bit of a positive affirmation to finish on you've spent this time with us it's it's been a long episode 35 minutes of your time that you've invested of all the podcasts of all the social media you could be scrolling through of all the youtube channels that you could be exploring you chose us and you chose to do something that's going to improve your health and your life so I want to congratulate you on that and thank you. And if you want to take it one step further, subscribe to our channels. Phil's got his social media handle up there too. You can follow him and yeah, hit that like button. It helps with our algorithm. It helps get this content out to everybody. Subscribe to the channels and leave us a comment. Let us know where you're at with your slap tear recovery. And if there's anything you need help with, we will be here there and here to support you. Thanks, Phil. Cheers.